I'll do it then. <laughs> Daniel. Oh, it's eight o'clock. Okay, let's see if I can remember to start recording. Um, okay, yeah, test two, exam two is on Friday. It will cover your September 25th and October 2nd homework, that material. Um, we will spend Thursday reviewing, okay? I will post a practice exam, uh, just, and, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, Mr. Miller, do you have anything you'd like to say? Um, yeah, uh, well, homework will be out, um, after my class this afternoon, um, oh. finish grading. So yeah, that'll be ready, um, in a few hours, probably. Okay, great. Um, how did they look as far as, um, they were all over the place this week. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, a lot of different scores. Um, some people were still kind of confusing, um, like the taking the second derivative with implicit differentiation. Oh, oh. Um, yeah. Um, most of them were pretty good, though. Um, I'll say that. Okay. Um, Each week, week, when you get your homework back, you should look at what you missed and make sure that you uh, figure out what you did wrong so you won't do it again, okay? The homework is to help you learn. It's really important that you do it and, and that you get feedback from it and correct your errors and learn. It's where you can get comfortable with the material. If you I know. find- I'm pretty sure a lot of people know but I'm also sure that a lot of people are bogged down by other people's work at the moment and can't immediately check it the moment they get it back. Okay, but, but we, uh, time management's a problem for everybody. Uh, you gotta give your, uh, the amount of time this course needs and it's significant. This is not a particularly easy course and it does require work. If you're not getting enough practice just by working the homework problems, your book or any good calculus text will have tons of problems you can practice on. Okay. I think that's all we need to talk about. Are the tutoring hours still on Blackboard? Yes, they are. Blackboard has so many items on it you'll have to do some scrolling through. I post them in chronological order, uh, more or less, but still there's tons of stuff up there at this point every day. Oh, I forgot to do that this morning. Okay, I haven't posted the notes from Friday's class and the recording from Friday's class yet, but I'll do that as soon as I finish too. No, I heard just a freaking giant Boom. Um, <laughs> I literally, I like, was like, you know, it's quiet. I almost like, you know, I look through the things. But like, you just pulled up, and I see this, like, thing whiz by me and hit the window. Okay, what's, would you turn your microphone off, please? <laughs> Whoever that is. Okay, thank you. All right. Let's get started. Uh, we were talking about the mean value theorem on Friday. I thought we were a couple more problems with that. And then we're going to start talking about, well, first part of curve sketching. Okay, so mean value theorem. 
um, it has two assumptions that is the hypothesis. This is the hypothesis. The, yeah, the hypothesis. Actually, it, it assumes two things. So the, both of those are together are the plural as hypotheses. So our assumptions are that F is continuous on the closed interval AB and it's differentiable on the open interval AB. And then the conclusion is there is some number C in the open interval AB such that F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. And notice this is, doesn't tell you how to find this number C. It just says it exists. So the slope of the tangent line at C F of C is equal to the slope of the line that goes through A F of A and B F of B. And I'll draw a picture from this example in a minute. Okay, so We've got f of x equal to x over x plus two. And we wanna consider the interval from one to four. Okay, well, let's just see what happens at one and four. Note that, let's see, this function is not continuous at minus two, but minus two is not in this interval. So that's not a problem. Okay. What is, let's, let's look at the point one F of one. That would be one and then F of one is one over one plus two. One, one third. And then at four, what would the point be? Um, one over four plus two, one, four, one sixth. Okay, hmm, those are, Y values are small. Let's see, we only care about the interval from one to four. And I'm gonna make this Y axis, stretch it out, okay, so that we can see. So I'm distorting things a little bit. So that would be one one third, and that would be four one sixth. Okay, so the curve probably, I don't know, do something like that. Um, but if I look at the line through the line through these two points, okay, and I'm going to do my best to sketch that. <laughs> okay, uh, that's not great. Okay, that's supposed to be a straight line. That red line, okay, it goes through. It contains the points one, one third, and four, one sixth. And has slope. Well, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, and that's going to be one sixth minus one third over four minus one, which is minus one sixth over three, which is minus one eighteenth. So yeah, I've got this line distorted. That, that's a very shallow line, but uh, it has negative slope and that makes sense because it's going down. 
Um, but the, the mean value theorem says, okay, that there's supposed to be some number C in between one and four. Oh, it looks like it's about there in my little rough sketch here. So that the slope of the tangent line at C is equal to the slope of the red line, okay? So, okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's what the mean value theorem says, but we were supposed to verify that the hypotheses of the mean value theorem are satisfied first. Okay, what are the hypotheses? The hypotheses are that if it's continuous on that interval, a, B, which is the interval, closed interval from one to four. Well, it is, right? The only place that F has a problem is at minus two, but minus two is not in that interval. So F is continuous on, on one, four. So one, so check, and two, if it's differentiable, on the open interval from one to four, okay. Well, actually the only place F is not differentiable is where it fails to be defined. Uh, and it is just the quotient of two first degree polynomials. Okay, let me write F of X down so I can keep going back. And we could use the quotient rule to compute F prime. Since uh, the bottom function is X plus two um, and it's never zero in this interval, F is differentiable on that open interval. So check for that. So the hypotheses are satisfied. Okay, so the mean value theorem then guarantees, yeah, proof is a, kind of a guarantee, <laughs> okay. It says that as long as you have the hypotheses satisfied, the conclusion must happen. such that F prime of C and we already computed that uh, that slope between those two points. Let's see, what was it? Yeah, we computed it right there. That was equal to minus 1 18th. We already know what that side says. Um, okay, so F prime of C, yeah, the mean value theorem guarantees the existence of this number C. It doesn't give you a clue about how to find it. So we'll have to find, find it ourselves. Um, well, how about computing the derivative? F prime, Uh, 
of x okay, would be, use the quotient rule, derivative of the top function, which would be one, times the bottom function, minus the top function times the derivative of the bottom function. Both the top function and the bottom function have one as a derivative over the bottom function squared. So that's equal to x plus two minus x over x plus two squared. When I clean it up some, that's x minus x adds out. That's two over x plus two squared. Okay. So there's your derivative. So now we use f prime of c minus one eighteenth. Okay, and now we have a little equation that we can solve. Whoa. Except that that can't be negative. <laughs> okay, what did I do wrong? <laughs> yeah, two over C plus two squared is, an, is a positive number and I got, then the slope's a negative number. I, I believe the slope should be negative. That means I messed up somewhere. It must have been in taking that derivative. Well, let's go back and check everything. Does somebody see where I went wrong? I always have to be checked. Okay, one f of one would be one over one plus two. Oh, I know what it was. It's four, I, I did that wrong. Okay. Forgot what the function was. That's supposed to be Okay, four over four plus two, which is four over six, which is four, two thirds. So that line C at C is the tangent line? Yeah. Okay, just and, that little <laughs> blue line is. That's a tangent line, yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure because I see this a lot with this and I'm not sure that was the tangent line or that was the tangent line. I was pretty sure it was like the blue one. The blue one's the tangent. The, the red one passes through two points on the curve. It's what you call a secant line. Okay, I, I was just making sure I understood that because I was very worried I had messed up my equations doing the wrong line. Okay, well, I messed up my equations. <laughs> okay, I forgot what the function was. Yeah, it's, it's x over x plus two. So when I get the point for four, uh, it would be four over four plus two, which is four over four over six. And so that the point there is four, two. Oh, so it's going up actually. Okay, so my picture is wrong. <laughs> okay. One little error and everything after that is wrong. That's the way math is. Okay, so let's go back and let's erase this. My picture is just wrong. And I was getting, yeah, anytime you get kind of contradictory <laughs> results, something's wrong. And it was right there. All right, so 
one one third. That's one, that's four. So now my picture's gonna change. One one third, call that one. That's one third. And four two thirds. Okay, so the curve's actually going up, which means that the slope ought to be positive, which makes sense in light of the derivative. Okay, so my curve, oh, let's see, I wanna do that in black. My curve, hmm, well, I don't know how it curves exactly. We're gonna learn how to tell that, but I'm just, okay. This is just a rough sketch. Um, it could kind of bulge above for, for all we know at this point. But the, oh, sorry. Okay. Now let's put that in red. The line through one F of one and four F of four. Okay, that's the red line. That's a secant line. That's this F of B minus F of A over B minus A that you see in the conclusion of the mean value theorem. That's it's the slope of that line, okay? The mean value theorem guarantees that there is some number C in between one and four, so that the tangent line at C is parallel to that red line, which means they have the same slope. Okay, so that's a rough, very rough picture. Okay, and this is wrong. That's two thirds. And this is wrong. Okay, so. Now, let's see, so four, six would be minus one half on top. Over, oh, what am I just doomed to? <laughs> that still doesn't make any sense. Mr. Miller, <laughs> what am I doing wrong? I think you changed the you change the one third to two thirds, so it's still one sixth minus two thirds down there. Uh, oh, thank you. You change the one sixth to two thirds minus one third. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm not, I'm not doing so well this morning. I apologize. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. That line ought to be going up. The slope should not be negative. All right, so now it's one third over three, which is one ninth. Okay, that makes more sense. All right, one ninth. And that means this is wrong. Okay. Okay, at least now it's possible. <laughs> this is a positive number. This cannot be a negative number. Not if I think I've got a solution. Oops. All right. There. Okay. But now I think we can find C. At least for this problem. Um, it's not always possible to find it. Uh, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation through by c plus 2 squared. So that'll give me 2 is c plus 2 squared over 9, and then multiply both sides of the equation by 9. Okay, and that gives me 18 is c plus 2 squared. And that's C squared. Uh, 
Oh, no. <laughs> there. C squared plus 4C plus 4. Which gives me okay, subtracting 18 from both sides. C squared plus 4C minus 4 minus 18 is minus 14. That's not pretty. But let's see. Uh, I don't think that's going to factor. Seven and two. No, I don't see, see how it could possibly factor. And check me, please. My track record so far this morning has not been great. Um, but I can always use the quadratic formula. So C is. Oh, it's unfortunate that I called it C. Uh, minus the coefficient of C yeah, right here, minus four. Plus or minus the square root of four squared minus four AC. Okay, where, let me write down. You have AX squared plus BX plus C is zero then x is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So four, so coefficient of c squared is one and the coefficient of c, well, c is c down here. That's that minus 14. This is not going to be a pretty number over two. So it is minus two plus or minus the square root of 16 uh, four times 14 be 56. Yeah. Over two. And that's minus two plus or minus the square root of, okay, 56 plus 10 is 66 plus two is 72. Okay. And that's 36 times two, 72 is, so that's minus two plus or minus 36 times two over two. And okay, I can use the rule that the square root of A times B is the square root of A times the square root of B. And that says that that's minus two plus or minus, okay, the square root of 36 is six times the square root of two over two, which is minus two plus or minus three times the square root of two. Okay. Well, so we got two possibilities, but minus two minus the square root of three times the square root of two, uh, minus two minus three times the square root of two is less than zero. So this, this value, so this C is not in the interval that we need it in. So that's not possible. We throw out that one. Uh, C equal to minus two plus three times the square root of two. Uh, three times the square root of two, let's make sure that's in there. Okay, three times the square root of two very roughly is 1.4. That would be two. And so, okay, so this, this number, in fact, it's a little bit bigger than 4.2. Uh, 4.2 minus two is then bigger than um, two. But it's less than four. So
So that's okay. Well, it's bigger than one. I love the C is any interval. So C equal to minus two plus three times the square root of two is the number C guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Well, that was a little tortured. <laughs> but are there any questions? You make an error. Okay. Nothing to do but go back and fix it. And it's pretty clear. When I got right here and I had a positive number equal to that minus one over 18, that's not going to work. You're not going to get any such C. So it was clear when I saw that that I made an error. I could go back and find it. When you screw up in math, you just have to go back and fix it. You don't pretend it didn't happen. Okay, no questions. Let's do one more problem with this. Before we move on to something else. Oh, and this material, by the way, is not on your exam. Your exam ended with the material on the homework you handed in Friday. This will be material on the third exam. So one more problem. And let's see. Let f of x equal to the absolute value of x minus 1. Oh, let me sketch that real quickly. This would be the, the absolute value of x is a like v-shaped thing. It's translated here. Or work through where the B has its point at one. It looks like that. Um, show that there is no value C such that. f of 3 minus f of 0 over 3 minus 0 is equal to f prime at c. Okay, so it looks like we're interested in the interval from 0 up to 3, this interval right here which I'll color red. So the interval is and the function is so let's see Let's compute f of 3 and f of 0. It'd be the absolute value of 3 minus 1, which is the absolute value of 2, which is 2. And f of 0 would be the absolute value of z minus, 0 minus 1, which is the absolute value of minus 1, which is 1. Okay, so f of 3 minus f of 0 over 3 minus 0 is 2, two minus 1 over 3 minus 0, which is 1 over 3. 
And let's see, let's put those points on our little graph. Uh, put them in blue. F of zero, F of zero is there, and three, F of three is there. Okay, so F of three minus F of zero over three minus zero is the slope of that blue line. Okay. But, so we got that. Well, we want to set that equal to F prime at C. Hey, well, what's F prime? F of X is the absolute value of X minus one. And well, it helps to you break this up into two pieces because the absolute value changes when you go through x equal to one. It's equal to x minus one when x is greater than or equal to one. And it's equal to minus x minus one when x is less than or equal to one. So f prime is going to be, I'm going to use this piece, makes it easier. The derivative of x minus one is one. But I got to worry about what happens at one. Um, and the derivative of minus x minus one is minus one. So, well, the graph of f prime. There's one, that's where the change occurs. F prime is one. And then F prime is minus one on the other side. Supposed to be horizontal. Okay, that's at minus one. And actually, Derivative doesn't exist at one itself. Okay, because that limit won't exist. All right, then that says that, oh goodness, it says that, well, okay, F if we want F prime of C equal to one third. Well, one third is not equal to one and one third is not equal to minus one. And that's the only two values that F prime takes. Why is this not a problem with the mean value theorem? Could it be because uh, if you use the mean value theorem to compare beforehand, you would see that uh, it would you would see that the uh, derivative is not continuous. Or, okay, basically, yes, Mr. Levy, the hypotheses are not satisfied, okay? Um, the derivative, in fact, it doesn't exist at one. 
so yeah there's no i'll fact i'll show that to you if y'all really want it that's where the knowing the definition makes uh helps you out oops i shouldn't use math notation uh Uh, there is no derivative at one. In other words, f prime at one does not exist. Uh, so, well, it, it, the hypothesis of the mean value theorem, it says that it's got to have a derivative at every point in the uh, open interval. Okay. There is no such point in the open interval. Yeah, this, this, well, all the way back. Yeah, this hypothesis is not satisfied in this problem. If it's not differentiable on the open interval from zero to three, because it does not have a derivative at one. And why couldn't you just call it one, one or minus one? Well, because of the definition of the derivative. In mathematics, you always go back to your definition. That's why I made you use that limit definition for the first problems. Okay, but in some excruciating detail here. The limit of f prime at one would be the limit as h approaches zero of f of what was x plus one. So uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this would be, I'm using the, oh, I'm sorry, let's see. Okay. Using the H definition, so this would be one plus H minus one. I know I'm getting my function, <laughs> my name of my function confused. Okay, so F of one plus H minus F of one over H. And that, well, H positive or H negative? And that's the problem. Uh, the limit as H goes to zero from the right, so positive H's of F of one plus H minus F of one over H would be the limit as H goes to zero from the right. Okay, what's our function? It's x minus one, so one plus h minus one minus f minus the absolute value of one minus one over h. And that's equal to the limit as h goes to zero from the right. Okay, one plus h minus one is just h. H is positive. I'm gonna write another step. Okay. Here, yeah, H is positive. So the absolute value of H is H, but I'm on the right hand side. And H over H is one. So the, that's limit from the right is one. The limit from the left, on the other hand, one plus H minus F of one, that would be the limit H goes from zero from the left of 
one plus h minus one minus absolute value of one minus one over h and one minus one is zero so that's going to be absolute value of h one minus one is zero over h uh, but now h is less than zero here coming in, coming in from the left so that that Absolute value of H is minus H. And that's minus one. So the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right. The limit as H approaches zero from the left is not equal to the limit as H approaches zero from the, that's from the right, this is from the left, okay. And if the limit from the left and the limit from the right are not the same, then there is no limit. So this does not exist. And that's why the mean value theorem is not contradicted you don't have the hypotheses satisfied. Therefore, you are not guaranteed the conclusion. And in this case, that means you are not guaranteed that the existence of that number C and it doesn't exist here. Any questions? Okay. So if we were going to, like, just to phrase our answer at the end, we would just write it exactly like you wrote it. It's just so no such C exists at this interval. Yeah. Um, I, I really like for you to, to, to write things out for me like that. A sentence with your conclusions and maybe not just some computations. Yeah, tell me what your computations mean. Um, somebody in the chat just asked, will we get problems like this often? <laughs> what do you mean by often? <laughs> You'll get some problems like this. This is just to help you understand what the mean value theorem says. I don't think there's any way at this point I can make you appreciate how important it is. If you take some um, higher level math courses, you will appreciate it more okay but it's important that you're at this stage that you know what it says even in the proof of a lot of the the results that we're going to use in calculus here it comes up so maybe i'll try to use it improving something in the future but yes you'll have a few homework problems on this kind of thing <laughs> and maybe a test problem but not this test Okay, so I'm gonna move a little bit further here. And just talk about what does the derivative of a function say about the function? quite a bit actually. And in fact, the, the second derivative is also, also gonna tell you a lot about the function. Let's just focus on the first derivative today. Here's something which I guess I'm gonna prove this for you because it's easy. Um, increasing, decreasing test. So let's just call different things, but I 
going to have time to prove it today, but it's not hard. If f prime of x is positive on an interval, then f is increasing on that interval. Oh, and I'll have to tell you what that means. <laughs> it's going up basically. I misspelled interval. This is part A. And if, if f prime is negative, Should be okay. That's a sentence that's that we should be capital F I. If F prime is less than zero on an interval, then F is decreasing. On that interval, so going down. And okay, well, let me tell you what that means. What is, yeah, let's say precisely what we mean by F is increasing. So definition, F is increasing on the interval I. And I don't care whether it's open or closed or bounded or not. Whenever X is less than Y in I, f of x is less than f of y. And you say, it's decreasing. On the interval i, If whenever X is less than Y in the interval I, F of X is greater than F of Y. So let's see some examples. Um, F of X. equal to 3x plus 1 is increasing over all the reals. Reals are one big interval. Because if x is less than y, that means that 3x is less than 3y. And that means that 3x plus 1 is less than 3y plus 1. Okay. Every time x is less than y, f of x is less than f of y. And the picture, 3x plus 1, the function is going up, okay, as your, as your x's increase, the f's increase too. Oh, one minute left. Well, here's an easy example of a decreasing function, minus six. And it's decreasing on all the reals. If x is less than y, well, that means that minus x is greater than minus y by your properties of inequalities. So f of x is bigger than f of y. 
And as X increases, then F of X is going down. Okay, so pretty natural ideas. And I'm out of time. So uh, you can leave class. We are finished. Uh, stick around if you have a question.